next on the OHIO Podcast. We preview Ohio State's big game against Northwestern, and we discuss if the CFP got their initial rankings right or not. And that all starts right now. It's so easy to be average. You know it as well as I know it. It takes a little something to be special, Don. It takes a little something special to be a great player. We don't have enough great players. The hell with that! We don't want to coach average. I don't want to be around you. Why be around average? Be proud of our young people in the classroom, in the community, and most especially in 310 days in Ann Arbor, Michigan, on the football field. Three things. Number one, the team that hits the hardest and the longest, the team that starts the fastest, and the team is too damn smart to make mistakes. If you take it to them, if you don't make mistakes, and you keep taking it to them, hell, there's no question who wins. Best Buckeye Podcast, by fans, for the fans, where they hate that team up north as much as you do. It's time for the OHIO Podcast. OHIO, and welcome back to the OHIO Podcast, everybody. I'm your host, Buckeye Bob, recording live from beautiful North Central Ohio, where I am joined by my co-host in crime, Chris Wilds. Chris, happy Thursday to you, my man. Oh, man, Eric, it was a beautiful day today once the fog lifted. Let me tell you, I uh, got to be outside a little bit today, so it was, it was a good day. Got to relax a little because they called us off of school, so got to spend some quality time with uh, putting my notes together for tonight. And, uh, you know, of course, I'm all excited about Saturday, not just because of, uh, obviously, the Ohio State game, but, uh, you know, I'm planning to win myself about a billion and a half dollars on uh, Saturday. So, <laughs> and I'm assuming you're going to do this on DraftKings because Ohio DraftKings Sportsbook is coming to celebrate. All new customers will receive $200 in free bets, plus five lucky customers will win a $100,000 free bet. <laughs> That's right. DraftKings Sportsbook is giving you $200 in free bets just for signing up today. No deposit required. Plus, you'll be entered to win a $100,000 free bet when you sign up. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and sign up with code OHIOPODCAST to get $200 in free bets to use once mobile sports betting hits Ohio. Plus. Five customers will win a $100,000 free bet only at DraftKings Sportsbook with code Ohio Podcast. Gambling problem? Call 1 800 589 9966. 21 plus. Physically present in Ohio. Eligibility restrictions apply. See terms at DraftKings.com slash sportsbook. Subject to regulatory licensing requirements. One per customer. $200 issued as Eight twenty-five dollar free bets. No purchase necessary for sweepstakes. Void where prohibited. In its first day, DraftKings is allowed to operate in Ohio. See terms at dking.com/oh. All right, Chris. So Ohio State is going to Evanston, Illinois, to play in that dump of a stadium one last time. We did mention a few weeks ago that Northwestern is getting themselves a beautiful new state-of-the-art stadium, which I cannot wait to one day go to and see. But Ryan Field in Evanston, Illinois, is exactly what I just called it. It is a dump. And Ohio State has had a lot of success in that dump, despite the fact that they grow the grass literally eight to nine inches High in the fall so that they can sort of try to get some kind of home field advantage. Before I break down the historical aspect of this game, I know you've looked into the statistics of Northwestern. 
Are you any bit concerned going into this game that our running game, which needs to be key when you go play a team like Northwestern in their home stadium with natural grass, is not up to par with where it needs to be? Because that seems to be the biggest story this week in Columbus is that our running attack is just not clicking. No, Eric, I'm not really worried about it. It's it's simply because of something you mentioned last week. I think that Ryan Day has learned. I think that we are going to use that short to intermediate passing game to open up the run game a little bit. Uh, You know, and this is the other thing. This is not a good defensive football team. They're just not. This is not a typical Pat Gerald defense. So. All right, Pat Fitzgerald defense. I'm I'm not worried at all about the running game. I think it gets healthy this week. I'm not so sure Mayan Williams even plays. Um, he has been practicing this week, so there's your update. Apparently, he's got a little bit of a, a soft cast or a cast that he's wearing on his his hand wrist area that was caused by the fact that some Big Ten chain gangs didn't drop the chains when they're supposed to when someone's coming when the play's coming to the out of bounds area which ryan day and ohio state apparently were very upset about this uh and 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 rightfully so but you know i I remember zeke in 2015 did the same thing did he not didn't he have a cast on his hand for a while yeah and i'll tell you eric like you said this is this is something that is common knowledge that you do when you're working a chain gang I mean, this is the kind of thing you'd expect to see out of a SEC official who doesn't know what's going on. Exactly. So breaking down Northwestern so far, and I don't want to, again, I don't want to break down their statistics, but I am going to look at their schedule this so far this year. <laughs> they are one and seven. Or were you going to do that, Chris? Oh, no, no, no. I'm just thinking if there's one team that had more cupcakes on their schedule than that team up north, it might have been Northwestern. And it's not been good results. <laughs> no, it hasn't. So they started the season overseas against Nebraska. They won that game, if you remember, over in Scotland, 31-28. to 28. Or was it Ireland? I don't know. One of the two. Anywho, they won 31-28 to 28 in week zero over Nebraska. And, of course, this was the beginning of the end for Scott Frost and Lincoln. So that was their one win. Since then, Northwestern is on a seven-game losing streak, including a eight-point loss to Duke at home, a seven-point loss to Southern Illinois at home, a three-point loss to Miami of Ohio at home, a 10-point loss to Penn State on the road. That was actually probably their best game, to be honest with you. They then lose at home by 30 Five to Wisconsin. They then go on the road and only lose by seven points to Maryland. So apparently they play better on the road, I'm guessing here. And then they go on the road last week in Iowa, in Iowa City, and lose by 20 to the Hawkeyes. This has not been a a good year for Patty Fitz. And this was supposed to be the every other year success that he seems to have. As you recall, in 2020 and 2018, they actually won the Big Ten West. Not so much this year. They're already pretty much out of it, and they're going to be out of it for sure mathematically after Ohio State eliminates them this week. That being said, Chris, let's break this down by the numbers. The Buckeyes lead the all-time series over Northwestern, (coughs) 64 wins, 14 losses, and one tie. Ohio State has won the last nine in a row. Last loss to Northwestern was in 2004, 33 to 27. The last meeting against the Wildcats was the 2020 Big Ten Championship game. Ohio State won that one 22 to 10, and it was a close game. Last meeting in Evanston, Illinois, however, was the previous year in 2019. Ohio State won that one 52 to three and if you as you recall that was uh, a big game from master teague thank you remember he had that big hole that was created by freshman dewan jones in that game oh yeah seems like it like it was forever ago but that was 2019 
Largest margin of victory, 1981. That was a 70-6 to six win for the Buckeyes. We might be knocking on that door this weekend. Yes. Say it. Largest margin of feet, defeat was in 1958. That was a 21 to nothing beatdown. Ohio State's longest win streak over Northwestern. Well, that's 24 from 1972 to 2003. Seems like a lot. However, that is not the longest win streak in the Big Ten. Michigan has one over Indiana that was longer, and currently Ohio State has the longest win streak over any opponent in conference, which is against Indiana. We will see them next weekend. Northwestern's longest win streak of Ohio State was three from 1929 to 1931. Ryan Day's record against Northwestern is 2-0, and while Pat Fitzgerald's record against Ohio State is 0 and Eight. Chris, let's hear about those statistics, my man. Well, I'll tell you what, Eric. Let's start with the Northwestern offense. Northwestern has the 90th ranked offense in the nation. They are averaging 362.6 yards per game. That's in the form of 249.3 passing yards and 113.4 rushing yards per game. They are only 120th in the nation in scoring, though, averaging just 17.9 points per game. Now, Ryan Holinsky is the statistical passing leader for the Wildcats. He has 141 completions on 244 attempts, 1,576 yards, six touchdowns, six interceptions. But Holinsky has been replaced under center. Sophomore Brendan Sullivan now leads the Northwestern passing attack. Sullivan enters this weekend's game with three games under his belt. He has faced Wisconsin, Maryland, and Iowa since assuming the role of QB1. He is 52 of 71, 416 yards, four touchdowns, three interceptions. Now, the real star of this offense, if there is one, is going to be junior running back Evan Hall. He is the team's leading rusher with 136 carries for 579 yards and three touchdowns. When Hall's off the field, junior Cam Porter assumes the rushing duties. He has 62 carries for 201 and two touchdowns. Catching the football, the Wildcats are led by junior tailback Evan Hall. He is the team leader in receptions with 45, second on the team in receiving yards with 461, and he is the team leader in receiving touchdowns with two. Malik Washington is the team's top outside threat at the wideout position. He does have 43 catches for a team leading 470 yards and one touchdown on the season. Eric, this offense is bad. I mean, aside from Iowa, this will be, I believe, the worst offense the Buckeyes see this season. And yes, that does include Toledo. That does include you know, Arkansas State, anybody else that we've, we've seen, these guys are worse than anybody except for perhaps Iowa. Mm. Now, defensively, this, as we mentioned, is not a typical Pat Fitzgerald defense. They're giving up 407.1 yards per game. That's 95th in the nation. They give up an average of 5.86 yards per play. And they're giving up 28.75 points per game. And and really, you know, you talked about their schedule earlier. They have yet to face a top-tier offense. Defensively, the team does have 14 sacks, five interceptions, seven forced fumbles. So they can get turnovers. They can get a little bit of pressure. The defense is led by junior linebacker Bryce Gallagher. Gallagher leads the team with 79 tackles to go along with one and a half sacks, an interception, and a forced fumble. Senior defensive lineman, and here, here we go, Eric. It's, it's, it's time to have fun with the name. Adetawima Adetabore. There we go. We'll go with that. Adetaboy. <laughs> That's right. Adetaboy. He leads the team in sacks with four. He does have Two forced fumbles as well. Linebacker Xander Mueller is the team's interception leader with two to go with two sacks and 65 tackles. Now, you talked about the struggles a little bit on uh, by the defense as well. 
This defense has struggled to contain even the average offenses this season. They have given up 30 or more points to Duke, to Iowa, to yeah Iowa, who at the time was college football's absolute worst offense. Uh, Maryland, and then to Southern Illinois, which I believe, Eric, is an FCS school, is it not? It is. So clearly not a strong defensive team. It seems likely that the potent Buckeye offense is going to have a very big day versus the Wildcats. And speaking of that offense, let's talk about that a little bit. The Ohio State offense comes in ranked sixth in the nation in total yards at 509.2 yards per game. And they are second in the nation at 48.9 points per game. This, of course, down a little bit after struggling a little bit with Penn State last week. It all starts with the Heisman candidate at quarterback, Eric. C.J. Stroud is 159 of 223. He has 2,377 yards passing on the season, 29 touchdowns versus only four interceptions. He's currently 12th in the nation in passing yards, first in the nation in touchdowns, and first in the nation in uh, total QBR with a QBR of 93.1. Running the ball, we've talked about it before. It's 1 and 1A, that tandem of Travion Henderson, who has 96 carries, 552 yards, six touchdowns. Mayan Williams enters Saturday, perhaps, with 76 carries, 525 yards, and 10 touchdowns. Catching the passes, of course, we've got Marvin Harrison Jr. out there. Marvin the Martian has a team-high 48 catches, 783 yards, 10 touchdowns on the season. And Emeka Egbuka just trailing by one catch. With 47 catches, he has a team-high 788 yards, which Harrison only trails by five yards, and seven touchdowns. I mean, these guys, you know, we talked about 1-1A and with the running backs. These guys are doing the same thing. Julian Fleming comes in 19 catches, 354 yards, six touchdowns. And finally, and, 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 you know, we've talked about nicknames for Cade Stover, Eric. I think that Bobby Carpenter may have had the best one. How about Farmer Gronk? (laughs) Cade Stover comes in, 24 catches, 309 yards, and three touchdowns in the season. Now, defensively, we gave up a lot of yards to a feisty Penn State team last week. The Buckeyes are now ranked sixth overall in defense in the nation, allowing 270.1 yards per game. I think that we get some of that back over the next couple of weeks. The Buckeyes still boast the eighth best scoring defense in the country, allowing just 16.8 points per game. The Ohio State defense has now created 16 turnovers, 10 via interception, nine for, with forced fumbles. They've had six fumble recoveries, and they now have 22 sacks on the season. The defense, of course, led by linebacker Tommy Eichenberg. Eichenberg has 72 tackles, as well as two and a half sacks, two passes defensed, and an interception on the season. The sack leader is still Mike Hall Jr., despite being limited in playing time. Hall still leads the team with four and a half sacks. Tanner McAllister leads the team in interceptions with three. And Zach Harrison leads the team in forced fumbles with two to go along with his 14 tackles sack, two passes defensed, and after last week, an interception. But really, what I can't wait to see this week, Eric, is how JT Tumalau follows up what he did last week. (laughs) You know, the human highlight reel last week had a bit of a coming out party. We all knew that he had the ability to do it. But man, he stuffed the stat sheet against the Nittany Lions. He now has 15 tackles, three sacks, a forced fumble, a fumble recovery, a pass defense, and two interceptions on the season, including a pick six. I really feel like the next three weeks are a major opportunity for this defensive front to really establish their dominance and gain a whole lot of confidence versus some lesser quality opponents as we move towards that big game November 26th. So, Eric, that's what we have 
as far as statistics go. I'm so glad you brought up JT Tumulau, Chris. Um, did you know that he earned from last week's game 16 Buckeye Leafs for his helmet? That is impressive. That's a yeah. good season for most players. I know. Like, I don't – like, I, someone said he's going to need a bigger helmet. <laughs> You know, I thought that was pretty funny. But if you look at what he did last week, I mean, and everybody nationally recognized that he was the National Defensive Player of the Year. Obviously, the Big Ten – or Player of the Week. The Big Ten Player of the Week on defense. And everybody I've heard, Eric, has said this may be the best game they have ever seen out of a defensive end in college football. And most comparisons I've heard are drawn to that huge game that Indomica Sue had, uh, and I don't remember the year, but it was his senior season. I remember that. And it was just dominant where he had a ridiculous number of sacks and tackles. But, Eric, I mean, overall, the sacks and the tackles are great. But this guy, JTT, just went out there and he put a stamp on that. He made that game his. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, he single-handedly changed the course of that game. Yes, he did. And that was, in my opinion, the most dominant effort I have ever seen by a defensive lineman in my many years of watching college football. I kind of got into it with a uh, Team Up North fan uh, the other day who basically said the only reason why we won that game was because of JTT. And I disagreed. I'm, I said, you obviously didn't see what the offense did in the second half of the fourth quarter. Like, no. we, liter- we literally scored, what was it, 21 that points will. in eight minutes? Yeah. Uh, and and uh, 28, but 21 of those 28 were from the offense. So it's not like, you know, it's not like we didn't all of a sudden, you know, forget how to score there. We we, we turned it on in those fi- that final quarter offensively. And so I, you know, I had to remind him like, Hey, when we score, we score in bunches, pal. So you're never safe. So it was not just a single man's performance, although he did, he did immensely help us. There's no doubt about that. Will there be an encore this week? I have to think that Eric, we have some really, really bad opponents the next two weeks. And we still don't know a hundred percent what we've got in Maryland. It could be three weeks of complete dominance that I really feel our defense has. If you look at the Northwestern offense and that Indian offense, I don't know if we will, but I would say we have the potential to shut out both of those teams. Mm. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely there's definitely I think the defense is hungry for a shutout. They haven't had one yet. Uh, we thought there might be a potential of one against Iowa. They did keep them out of the end zone. They did score a field goal against us. And, of course, the pick six is where they got their touchdown from. But, or excuse me, the fumble recovery, that is. Yeah. Um, but the defense only gave up three points that game. So there is the potential, I think, there to for that to happen. I don't think it will this week. I think Northwestern's going to going to put a score up on the scoreboard. I don't give them much of a chance to score any touchdowns. But I'm going to give him a field goal, not to give away my prediction here. But I just yeah, feel well, like I both have that, Eric. So <laughs> I I just feel like this defense, they're playing with tremendous confidence. As long as they sure up a little bit of that missed tackling that happened against Penn State, um, there's uh, there's really nothing the next three teams I think can and, really. And how intense do you think practice was this week when Jim Knowles looked at that film and saw the sloppy tackling? I'm sure he really got on a few guys, no doubt about it. There's, he's he's a he's an interesting cat, man. Like he he won't throw any players under the bus, but uh, he'll go after some guys in practice when the media is not watching. So, um, yeah, I definitely think he's got definitely the pulse of this defense. There's no doubt about that. All right, let's go ahead and give our score predictions, Chris. I'll go ahead and since I since I went ahead and kind of uh, teased it. Uh, I'm going 63 to three, Chris. 63 <laughs> to three. Is that what you got? I had 66 to three. Ooh, man, we're close. Now, the the what is the spread? 38, I think. 
Yeah, and, and for once, Eric, I don't – even though it's huge, I don't think it's enough. No, I don't either. Um, the other thing that's going to be very interesting here is, is as you recall, last week we even talked about it when, at the end of the game – when Penn State drove down and got that meaningless touchdown at the end of the game, it was like, oh, well, there went the spread. You know, like we like all the people who were betting were like, oh, no, I think if you take the over here, you're going to be good. I just don't see Ryan Day taking his foot off the pedal with the second string offense like he has been. You know, we have got to get these second string guys meaningful snaps. Uh, meaningful reps against quality opponents. They haven't got that this year. They get in the game late, and it's just handoff, handoff, handoff. They're not really running the real offense. He's got to get that because, God forbid, if something were to happen to C.J. Stroud. Yeah, McCord's got to be ready to go. Kyle has got to be ready to go, and I don't know that he is. And I think some of that falls on the fact that Ryan Day's being a little bit too nice to these other Big Ten coaches here. Yeah. Um, let's go Let's go ahead and go out. We're, we get up by 40-some points. You take You take C.J. out after he scored four or five touchdowns. He's feeling good about himself. You put Kyle McCord in, and you keep the gas pedal down. Let the offense run, okay? I'm going. I'm going 63-3. You got 66-3. We'll get Aaron's prediction hopefully um, um, uh, before the game on Saturday. But that's where we're at. And of course, you all can give your prediction as well. Go to Facebook tomorrow morning. You'll see the graphic that says Buckeye Nation. Are you ready with our predictions? You add your predictions to those in the comment section below. And if you get the exact score, you're the first one to predict the exact score. You will win a free t-shirt from the OHIO podcast. You know, what's better than winning a free t-shirt from the OHIO podcast. I I got a great idea, Eric. You know, there's only one thing that would go good with that t-shirt. I think I know what you're leaning towards here. And my, my head says it has to do with protecting my head. Absolutely, and there's no better way to protect your head than with a woody hat. That's right. No one wants to get TTU in on the, on the head. You got to cover that thing. That's you cover, right. You cover it with a woody hat. Chris, we've got <laughs> – we have got – we've been joking about it, but we got them, don't we? We got them, and they're, they're awesome. And I'll tell you what, right now there's only two ways to get them. Has to contact us directly through our uh, website or beginning the Friday after Thanksgiving. Yes, the CB Superfans website will be the official distributor of our uh, OHIO podcast merchandise. Mm, so Black Friday. I Black like Friday, it. the site's going, going live. We're gonna. We might have to order some more Woody hats because some of the people who were at the house Saturday told me on Sunday that they need themselves a Woody hat. So <laughs> it's they're gonna go quick if you know what I'm saying. So. Absolutely, I've had, they, they are so stylish, Eric. Uh, you know, do we have a picture of them up there on the website yet? Not, not yet. I will. I know people have been laughing about this who listen to the show. Uh, you and I have been joking about it. Brian King said, hey, I thought that was supposed to stay on the podcast when I made that joke with you today about uh, getting a Woody hat in your uh, Halloween costume. <laughs> so, hey, you, you can't stop the Woody hat. It's going where it's going. It's good. Yeah, it, it, the Woody hat goes where it wants to go. It's got a mind of its own, you know? That being said, let's take it. Might a be a good time for a commercial break, Eric. It's a great time for a commercial break. I'm sure Mastermind, as our sponsor, really appreciates us talking about this right before they get to talk about themselves. But, hey, it is what it is. We'll, we'll come back from that commercial <laughs> break and dive into the second part of the show. The OHIO Podcast is brought to you by Mastermind. Mastermind specializes in 360-degree high-definition mobile video mapping, GIS integration, and traffic safety studies. Mastermind cares about traffic safety and keeping you safe on the roadway. Visit Mastermind at OnlineMastermind.com. 
And welcome back to the OHIO podcast, everybody. All right, man. We got a boom this week, Chris. Caden McDonald wants to be a Buckeye. Tell me about this guy. I'll tell you, Eric. I love what I saw from this kid. Caden McDonald's a 6'3", 310-pound interior defensive lineman from North Gwinnett High School in Suwanee, Georgia. He's a four-star recruit, currently ranked 293rd nationally for the 2023 cycle. I don't know who's ranking these guys because this kid needs to be a whole lot higher than that. He's 40th among defensive linemen, 27th out of the state of Georgia. You know, Eric, McDonald possesses really good size, I think, for an interior defensive lineman at 6'3". He's coming in at 310 pounds. He might be able to lean that up a little bit, but I'll tell you what, I don't want to see this kid change a whole lot about that size. He's athletic. He's got a really good explosive first step, especially given, like I said, that size. He shows good footwork. I think he's got some nice body control. He's got a little bit of twitch that you don't know. We normally don't see in a guy that that big. Uh, he uses his hands really well, and he's adept at shedding blocks and getting into the backfield. Has the ability to bust through the line using speed or power. He also shows versatility to play a few spots along that four-man defensive front. Uh, you know, I think he's got him projected probably as a one technique, but this guy has the athleticism to play that three technique as well. And Eric, just to give some perspective on what this young man is capable of, I don't know if you saw his junior and senior numbers. As a junior, he played a full season. He had 95 tackles. 62 were tackles for loss. Good night. 20 sacks, 15 hurries, and three pass deflections. As a senior, he played a little less than eight games. He had 37 tackles, 27 of those being tackles for loss, eight sacks, and nine hurries. This kid lives in the backfield, and Eric, he's doing it in Georgia 7A football. This is the top tier of high school athletics in Georgia, and Georgia's a pretty daggone good football state. He also had, and then this is just goes to show his athleticism. He also had 35 carries for 176 yards and six touchdowns. Yeah, they call him saying they call him like the like they're calling the fridge of high school football. Yeah, yeah, the kid is just amazing. I absolutely love this get this get. You know, I heard several people that you know the the so-called, you know, specialists, the, the the guys who should be in the know, saying this kid may be the steal of the recruiting cycle. Wow. Being ranked at 293rd. I believe it. This kid is a serious baller. I can't wait to see what happens when Larry Johnson gets a hold of this guy. Dang, God, that's, that's good stuff, man. So I did get a chance to watch his, um, his film. And... I like what I saw. Uh, I, I think he's got a really good, quick first step. He stays very low. He's six three, which you think is like yeah. really big, right? But he doesn't appear big on film because he's always so low, which is really, really important uh, to get leverage down in the trenches, especially in the middle. I, I call him kind of a like a a run stuffer. I think he's kind of one of those guys that uh, um, can hit a gap and just he just clogs up running lanes right so he's got that going for him uh i i don't know what you saw in him but i i see a little bit of robert landers what do you see you know i think that's a good comparison i really do i'll tell you what i see i see a whole lot of pain for for, you know opposing running backs (laughs) and you know what with a guy coming in with 20 sacks and, and 15 hurries, I'm thinking the quarterbacks might not be that safe either. So yeah, he's yeah. got he's got Devon Hamilton size, but he plays very similar to the way BB Landers played, and I really like BB Landers was one of my favorites because I I love the guy's personality, but I also love the guy. The guy, how many times did BB Landers make tackles? in the backfield where you're, you're just like, how did he get through there? You know, like he just yeah. found a way to get through the line and make a tackle in the backfield and trip up the running back, you know, with shoestring tackle and things. And so I see a lot of BB Landers and Caden McDonald. And I, 
anytime we can go down to Georgia and pluck a kid out of SEC country that a lot of SEC teams wanted, um, including LSU, Tennessee, Georgia, um, some of those final final offerings or, or final teams that came down to the wire. Well, Clemson for him. was on his list. It was Clemson, Michigan, and Ohio State? Yeah. So uh, Miami, of course, was up there as well. But those were like the, the three he was deciding on. And I got to feel it came down to Ohio State and Clemson because it didn't really sound like Michigan was really in on it to begin with. So, yeah, to win one over Clemson is is important. And, you know, I it just goes to show that, you know, sometimes these, these rankings are a little bit off because I'm with you. Like, I saw the ranking and I was like, eh, I don't know about this. Then I watched but For the me, film. I think this kid's a top 100 guy right now, Eric. You think so, that high? I really do. I love the I film. Think that kind of impact. Yeah, I love the film, but I don't know that I'm that high on him. But I did love the film, and I, I think he's got a lot of, he's got a, he's got a motor on him. So let's just see, you know, see what happens. Now, wh- which film did you see? Junior film. Junior film. Okay. Mhm. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't seen his senior film yet. I did watch the junior film, and I liked what I saw. So. Well, he was living in the backfield that junior year. Yeah. He really was. You know, sometimes it's interesting to see what else maybe they had on that team on the defensive line that was kind of, you know, other teams had to concentrate on that was allowing him to, you know, get one on one matchups that he was dominating. But there was a few times I saw he was being double teamed. Yeah. And, and still, he was really able to shed those blocks well, mm-hmm. even though he was being double teamed. Exactly. Yep. He was still doing a really good job. So welcome to the fold, Mr. McDonald. All right. Let's talk about uh, our Facebook poll question, shall we? Let's do it. I decided to throw the the following question up on Facebook a couple days ago, Chris, and I am very interested in getting your opinion of the results here. Of course, Tuesday night, the college football playoff committee announced their first rankings. Tennessee was one, Ohio State two, Georgia three, Clemson was four, Michigan was on the outside at five looking in, and Alabama was six, much to the demise of most of college football fans who wondered how in the heck TCU is at seven. Uh, Then you had Oregon eight, USC nine, and the total BS move of it all, LSU 10. That I don't get at all. That being said, the question was, the CFP committee announced their first rankings. Not necessarily the order, but did they get the right four teams in? Tennessee, Ohio State, Georgia, and Clemson. No. Chris, I know what you said. I already know because I saw your comments, and I was so glad that I'm like, Chris is passionate about this. I'm I'm, I'm liking it. However, by a vote of 71 to 45, so 62% to 38%, those OHIO podcast listeners and fans said, yes, the CFP committee did get the right teams in. I have a feeling that I know why they said yes, but go ahead and tell me why it should be no. Okay, let's let's put our fandom aside here. You know, I, I don't disagree with Tennessee at one, first of all. They belong at one. They do have the best signature wins of the season. So I don't have a problem with that. I love Ohio State at two. I think that's where they belong. Georgia does have a nice signature win over Oregon early on. They're undefeated. They're still the national champs until somebody beats them right now. I don't mind them at three. Clemson does not belong at four. You know, we talked about the cupcakes that that team up north played. But they have at least faced some quality teams and some adversity this season. And Clemson just has not. They really have. You know, we talk about how bad the Big Ten West is. The ACC isn't much better. I really truly believe that team up north belongs in that fourth spot right now followed by Clemson, and then TCU. I don't like the fact that they've got Alabama ranked over TCU. Honestly, I might even have Clemson up at five, or or TCU at five, 
Clemson six and Alabama seven. The fact is, if you have a loss, I don't care who it's to, and you've played the type of games they've played this season, the whole season, typically Alabama, yeah, even if they had a loss to a Georgia or what have you, they are dominant in their other games. They're just not dominant this year. They should have lost to Texas. Uh, you know, they they were they had challenges from other teams all season. This is a team that really did not belong in the top six. Once you get past that, like you said, LSU is a joke at 10. But outside of that, the top 10, I don't mind a whole. Yeah, I'm down with the, I'm down with the top 10 outside of LSU being there. I don't think LSU deserves to be at 10. The only reason why I think LSU is there at 10 is to prop up Alabama being at six when they beat them this weekend. Yes, that's, that's my, exactly right. Yeah, that's, that's how I feel. That's because, I, again, and not get ahead of ourselves, but if something happens at Georgia this week, we we could see that scenario. I'm just saying. Yeah, oh, yeah, I know. So there's definitely there's definitely some interesting stuff going on there. Um, do you think, like I think, that the 62% of the people who said yes – Simply like the fact that a Michigan is not in the top four. I think it's that. I think I think that a lot of people cannot put their fandom aside. And, and don't get me wrong. As a fan, I understand that. But as someone doing the podcast, I'm trying to put my fandom aside and look at this realistically. Realistically, I believe that team up north does belong in the top four. Okay. I'm not going to I'm not going to dissect this anymore. You can go back and listen to Dotting the Eye with da- Davis and Chad. I was on their show this week uh that aired Tuesday night. Uh, I, we we posted a copy of that on our so uh, on our Facebook page, business page. You can check that out. Um if you'd like to listen to that, that whole show is about the college football playoff uh, rankings and the initial reveal and all of that. So I'm not going to dive any more into it. I've, I'm kind of done talking about it already. Basically, I, I feel like for the most part, if you win your games and you go win your conference, if you're Ohio State or that team up north at this point, you just got to win out. You win out, you're in. Don't worry about it. Uh, same for Tennessee and Georgia. Just win out and you're in. Alabama, mm, they got maybe a little bit of help that uh, they're, they're going to need, but they're going to get it. So if they went out, they're in. So it's just a matter of who's going to win out and you're in. Uh, that being said, let's go ahead and talk about our big week 10 big game predictions, Chris. Since we've been talking about Georgia, Tennessee, and Alabama, let's talk about their big games this weekend, beginning in Athens, Georgia, where that number one ranked team in the college football playoff committee, number two in the AP, Tennessee, visits number one ranked Georgia. Who do you got, Tennessee or Georgia? Well, I'll tell you what, Eric. I've gone back and forth on this one all day. I've switched my my choice at least five times today. I think that Georgia defensively is something that Tennessee has not seen this year. I think that Tennessee off- offensively is something Georgia has not seen this year. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to make Aaron proud here. Defense and running the ball wins D championships. I'm going to take Georgia at home. I think Georgia curb stomps Tennessee this weekend. I think Cinderella loses her glass slipper this weekend. I really do. I think if Tennessee's for real, they're going to have to do it. They're going to have to prove it to me this week. I've just seen too much Tennessee where they are not impressive year after year. They're, what, 15 years of just being blah in 20-some since Peyton Manning's been there and won a national championship? I Georgia right now has got the depth. They've got, they've got the running game, like you said. They've got the defense. They've got a competent quarterback who's yeah, playing pretty that's well. A, that's a Bennett is a great – Game he can manager. put up big numbers, but he's a good game manager. He doesn't make a lot of mistakes. Yeah, Stetson Bennett is not going to lose this football game. So 
and 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 they've got the dudes everywhere else. I just feel like Georgia is going to get a lead, and then they know how to milk a game, man. Yeah, they're just going to play keep away from Tennessee, run the ball, run the clock, probably win, end up winning by two scores, ten points or more, um, probably more. And I think Tennessee's dream is going to be kind of crashed, come crashing down at that point because at that moment Tennessee will have no way of winning the SEC, and then they're going to be a one-loss SEC team without a SEC championship to bolster their resume, and I think they're probably going to end up being on the outside looking in. Um, Now let's talk about Bama. They are on the road at LSU. Again, you know which way I'm going here. I think LSU being ranked 10th um, in the CFP is totally for Alabama's – profile and resume builder uh, this week because they're 15th in the AP. Yes, LSU is getting better, uh, but they still have on their resume a bad loss to uh, Florida State at the beginning of the season. And they also lost to, was it Mississippi State or Ole Miss? can't remember. They just beat Ole Miss, didn't they? Yeah, they just beat Ole Miss. Must have been Mississippi State that I think who they lost to. I'm going to look it up real fast. Anyways, I'm going Bama. Who you got? You, you know, Eric, uh, again, I wish I could disagree with you here, but I can't. Even though I think Alabama is six is a joke as well, I just think they are overall the better team. I think LSU does have a couple quality wins, but they are over teams that were mythically better than they really were. Ole Miss, you know, they play Bama tough every year, but they're they're not a great team. Uh, even though they went in there, what they they went in undefeated, I believe, right? Who Ole Miss? Ole Miss and LSU. Yeah, they lost. That was their first loss of the. That season. was their first loss. They were a mythically good undefeated team, I believe. LSU's other loss was a forty to thirteen beating by Tennessee. Yeah. Yeah, so that, yeah, that was bad. This, this is going to be an Alabama beatdown. All right, the next two are going to be a little bit more interesting. Let's go over to the ACC slash wannabe ACC. Clemson goes on the road to South Bend, Indiana to take on the bipolar Notre Dame Irish. Notre Dame has played very well on the road, Chris, but this one is not on the road. This one's in their home stadium where they have been choke artists this year. Clemson, uh, like he's ranked fifth in the AP. They are fourth in the college football playoff committee uh, or the CFP. They have beaten the likes of, uh, as far as ranked teams, Wake Forest, NC State, and Syracuse. This might be the best team they play, in all honesty. If Notre Dame can get their heads out of their butt at home and play like they have on the road. Clemson barely beat Syracuse at home. Notre Dame went into their dome and just curb stomped Syracuse. Yep. Giving that, hopefully that team some confidence as well as the, that fan base some confidence. So that being said, which way you're going Saturday night, South Bend, Golden Domers or the Fighting Dabos? You know what? I said it before. I'll say it again. I think the ACC is a weak conference. I think that Marcus Freeman finally figures out how to get it right at home. I think Notre Dame takes down Clemson and ends their college football hopes. (laughs) Nice. Okay. So, Chris, I said – at the beginning of the season, Clemson would lose three games. They should have lost two so far, in my yep. opinion. Um, every time I said they would lose, they have won. So I'm going to do a little bit of reverse psychology here. I'm going to pick Clemson with the hope that they lose this game. <laughs> but I'm going to go ahead and say Clemson's going to take this one. Um, so there's the first one we disagree on. This one, I couldn't freaking tell you who to pick here. Number 20 ranked Wake Forest on the road at number 21 ranked NC State over in the SEC. 
I guess I'm going to go Wake Forest, but Chris, I have no idea. I'm just taking the Demon Deacons because I like Deacons. Well, I'll tell you what. I'm going to take NC State here strictly because they are at home. Okay. Uh, I think this was a coin flip game. I'm giving it to the home team. So, so far, Chris, this year when we've done this, when we've split multiple games, we've split the games as well, meaning you've won one, you've lost one. I've won one, I've lost one. Well, then I sure hope Wake Forest wins. (laughs) Oh, that's right. (laughs) Me too. (laughs) If we're going to split them, that's the way I want it to go. Give me... Give me the Domers and, and let Wake Forest have it. I'm okay with that. There you go. All right, man. So so uh, right now we are tied in our big game predictions, Chris. We are both 19 and 14. Aaron is right behind us, though, at 17 and 16. Well, Chris, we've come to that point of the show where I really just want to end my life. Power yeah. rankings. I, I hey, mean, we, we have a top three now. We have a we have a solidified top four, top five. So for a second straight week, the top five is exactly the same. Ohio State one, Michigan two, Illinois three, Penn State four, Maryland five. So for a second straight week, the combination of everybody's power fives has given us the same top five. Minnesota has jumped back in. Uh, the top half now at sixth, and Purdue stays steady at seven. So the top half again, Ohio State one, the team up north two, Illinois three, Penn State four, Maryland five, Minnesota six, Purdue seven. I'm pretty confident outside of maybe Wisconsin possibly being up in there as opposed to Maryland or Purdue that that is indeed the best seven in the Big Ten. Again, I can make an argument for maybe Wisconsin. And really, I think Wisconsin's better than Purdue because they proved it on the field, right? Right. But for some reason, the the way the power rankings have gone, Purdue is is at seventh and Wisconsin is eighth. But I digress. For the most part, take those eight. Let's say those top eight because Wisconsin's at eight. Those are the best eight in the Big Ten, and I think you could interchange Minnesota, Purdue, Wisconsin from week to week. You agree? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think, you know, it basically comes down to tiers. You've got a top two, which is one tier. You've got three, four, five, which I think is another tier. And then you've got that six, seven, eight, that's another tier. And then you've got what's left which just sucks yeah so illinois they've got a home game this week against sparty which is who who is reeling we'll talk about them in a second a home game against purdue next week then they go on the road to finish their season at that team up north and then at northwestern so really outside of their game against that team up north and then maybe if depending on which purdue team shows up illinois could I think win three other loss four, which means they would probably stay exactly where they are in the power rankings if they do that. Um, But the big 10 is crazy. So you might see something crazy happen. Bottom half, Wisconsin eight, Iowa nine, Sparty moves down to 10. Rutgers 11, Nebraska 12, Indiana 13, Northwestern 14. Those final four all on the same spot as well. Let's talk about Sparty. Coming off the terrible dis- terrible display of what happened in the tunnel in Ann Arbor, eight players, I think it is, have been suspended. Been suspended, yes. From the team. Uh, two or three recruits have decommitted that I've read so far. I know two for sure. I think maybe three, if I'm not mistaken, have already decommitted. Mel Tucker has lost this program, it seems like. Uh, Sparty Nation is very split on whether he should go. Or, rest- or remain as the head coach at this an time. Awful big buyout. What's that? That's an awful big buyout. It is a big buyout, but they might. I don't be know whether it's the wrong decision, though. They might be able to get it uh, lowered significantly, given what has happened. Yeah. Um. They're reeling. Obviously, I don't know what's going to happen to them. To be honest with you, they're three and five. I mean. 
I guess they would have to win three out of the last four games to make a bowl game. Two of them are definitely winnable. Two of them are difficult. They're on the road at Illinois. Then they host Rutgers and Indiana back-to-back before going on the road to Happy Valley. They're going to lose to Penn State at the end of the season. I think they're going to lose this week against Illinois. That means that they're going to finish the season no better than 5-7. and seven. I think Rutgers beats them as well. Ooh, really? Yeah, this is a team in turmoil. I they think are in turmoil. As yeah. well. Uh, we've already seen Nebraska's head coach, Scott Frost, get fired. We already saw Wisconsin's head coach get fired in the middle of the season. Quick question, Chris, to end this show. How many more Big Ten coaches might get the ax this season? What's the well, over-under? Think- one and a half. I'll put it at one and a half. What do you say? I think there is potential for the over. I think a lot of that determined is determined by what happens with Mel Tucker, but I've got a serious feeling that Mel Tucker's, you know, definitely on the hot seat after what's happening. Like you said, I truly believe he's lost control of the program. The 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 boosters and the school are not going to sit and wait if he continues to lose recruits. Um, and, and I don't see this, this end of the season finishing well for them. Given the fact they've lost eight players already out of this, and who knows what still may happen. You could, I mean, they're still talking about the potential for criminal charges. This program may have to cut ties. Uh, and, and I know another one that, Everybody kind of loves is is Tom Allen over there in Indiana. But I'll tell you what, that's just a bad team. They have regressed so bad since the loss of Michael Penix Jr. A few years ago, they've just regressed to a, a total different brand of football. I, I do believe that he could possibly be in jeopardy as well. Um other than that, I don't. Uh, you you may even see one more go. I don't know. What about what about Kirk over in Iowa? You know, a lot of the fan base, despite loving him, they are not happy with the fact that he just seems to ignore the fact that uh, their offense is just putrid. Yeah, and, and the fan base is upset about it. But you know, is the university going to be? willing to make the move. That's the question. I think a lot of that determines on what Ference does at the end of the season regarding the offensive coordinator position. Does he sack up and say, sorry, son, you got to go? Or does he continue to defend him? I think if he continues to defend him, they may both be looking for new jobs next year. Uh, he won't be looking for a new job. I think if he, if they, if if they ask him to step down and he does, he's done with coaching. He, he's. You don't think he'll go for that 114th year in coaching? No, no, I think 113 is enough. Okay. <laughs> what about the the coach we're playing this weekend? I think he's safe. You know, but Pat Fitzgerald. They in love Northwestern Pat has Fitzgerald at Northwestern. He's alumni. He he was a great player for him. Every couple of years, he gives them a pretty good program. Usually, I think that his successes outweigh his his downfalls. Um, and given the fact, let's face it, they are a scholastic institution first and foremost, and he gets the most out of the kids that he has. The fact is, this year, he just doesn't have a lot of horses. I think he sticks around. Yeah, I think he's safe as well. Um, I, I I would not be surprised if Kirk Ferentz steps down at the end of the season. Uh, I think Tom Allen's probably safe for one more year, but I think he will be on the hot seat next year. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with Tucker and and and. East Lansing. That to me is very, very interesting right now. So, and you just never know what's going to happen in Ann Arbor. I mean, if that, if that, if that NFL job opens up, will he leave? 
Yeah, what, he's what already shown you. They come to Columbus and he gets completely blasted. I don't know. I mean, the way these fans in, in that on that program are so hot and cold on him is is unbelievable to me. So we'll see. Yeah, they change their opinion of Harbaugh more than they change their underwear in Michigan. So. <laughs> well, it's, that that's not very much though. I know, sad, isn't it? It is. It's kind of kind of gross. Kind like, of explains that smell that comes down here. Yeah, which this is a good time to remind you of my Ann Arbor story as we as we get ready to close the show. So, and I've I've shared this before, Chris, but it, it's so good I got to share it again. So we're on our way up to uh up to the northern part of the state to go camping and spend some time by the Sleeping Bear Sand Dunes. And I know it's sacrilegious to say you should go up there, but it is very, very beautiful. It's worth the trip. That being said, we are on our way up uh, 23, hit 75, going through Toledo, cutting across the state lines. We're getting close to Ann Arbor. You see the signs. And my stepson, who was asleep in the car, wakes up. And we, and at that moment, we are literally just outside of Ann Arbor, and we are driving by the uh the water treatment plant and he goes <laughs> what is that smell and i said that son is ann arbor michigan it sticks <laughs> best timing ever and i <laughs> that was a very teachable moment if you will <laughs> So that's one of my favorite uh, stories about driving through the putrid state of Michigan. All right, guys, that's our show for this week. Enjoy the game this Saturday. It should be a relatively stressless uh, a Saturday afternoon. Hopefully the Ohio State Buckeyes jump out big early and uh, we get a lot of that uh, second string depth playing. The game is a noon kick on ABC. So feel free to tune into that if you're not going to Chicago to watch the game. By the way, there are plenty of tickets available, and they are cheap, are they not, Chris? We have looked them up. You yeah, we get, looked at that. and uh... <laughs> You can get two tickets to that game, about half the cost of one ticket to an Ohio State game right now. So, Well, I'm surprised they aren't just trying to give the things away, Eric. I mean, as I said, not a good team whatsoever this season. No, not good at all. But enjoy that game, everybody. Um, contact us if you'd like a Woody hat. We will try to get pictures of that up on uh, our Facebook page. Chris and I actually have a couple commercials that we might be posting, but whew, boy, I don't know, Chris. <laughs> I went back the, and watched The FCC things, might man. have something to say about that. Eric. Yeah, they. they uh, I know Facebook will have something to say about that, Eric. Yeah, we I've, I've rethought these commercials a little bit, uh, so we might have to be careful on that. But I digress. <laughs> be kind to one another. I owe someone's O H and sing Carmen Ohio with all your heart. And until next time, O H I O. Go Bucks. Oh, come, let's sing Ohio's praise. And songs through Alma Mater While our hearts rebounding thrill And joy which death alone can still Summer's heat Oh, winter's cold, the seasons pass, the years will roll. Time and change will surely show how firm thy friendship. Oh, hi.